Welcome to our pre-show. We'd like to welcome our replay viewers and remind you that you can watch this webcast at any time. All of our shows are archived on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We hope you'll comment about the topics we discuss. Today we have an update on dis disaster relief efforts after Hurricane Florence and a new vocational training partnership in the Chicago area. We'll also speak with program director at Mechanics Local 701, which has a great apprenticeship program, and IAM General Counsel Mark Schneider will give us some insight on Supreme Court history. We'll take a look back at the Lochner era, which started in, I think, 1897 and lasted for 40 years. And we're going to watch a little preview video, and then Mark will uh, share his thoughts on that era with us. So that's what's coming up. I'm sitting here with Delane Adams, our communications rep. We have about a minute before the official show starts. So I'll let Delane say hi while I start my stream so I can see your comments. Hello, audience. Activate live. Starting soon. There was something we were going to talk about. What was it? Probably Joe and Rich. Oh, no. Somebody's, <laughs> somebody's hiring. You said somebody's hiring. Oh, yes, yes. Lockheed. Lockheed, uh, they're officially hiring at least 800 people uh, for Fort Worth. So that's good. That was just announced in the Dallas Business Journal. That's so great news. That's good news, for, uh, good news for the country, good news for the IAM, uh, good news for Fort Worth. So it's great. It was wonderful. We took a tour of Lockheed Martin, and we were able to see... Uh, the production line was more than a mile long. Yeah, production line, I think, if, if not, I think pictures are posting soon from that tour. So great pictures uh, from Alex, uh, who takes pictures for Lockheed. So he uh, shared pictures with us, and the pictures look great. Well, it is 3 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Fight for your right. Speak up. Speak out. We're, we're union, union and we're, we're proud. proud. Go Union. Welcome to Activate Live, our weekly show highlighting machinist union members in North America. I'm Tanya Hutchins, a communications representative, coming to you live from our headquarters in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. And here is Delane Adams with the latest IAM news. Delane? Tanya, how are you doing? Doing okay. Thanks All for right. being here. Well, unfortunately, we start off with uh, strike news. So we have uh, 200 IAM members on strike at United Technologies in Cheshire, Connecticut. Um, That's in our Eastern Territory. Eastern Territory. We're going into the third day of the strike. Uh, you see some of the pictures up there on the screen. Some of the issues include rising health insurance costs. Um, like you said, United Technologies. Uh, you see a picture of Tony right there uh, standing with um, someone who's running for Congress, I believe. Um, but again, you know, you have a company like UT UTC that posted nearly $14.7 billion uh, in revenue last year. So again, um, we stand with local 62A and uh, we stand in solidarity and hopefully this will end soon. You know, it's so hard when health care costs go up, gasoline yeah. care, gasoline costs go up, and you're trying to keep those cost of living increases and trying to take care of your health and to, and to work for a company that makes billions of dollars and be struggling you know, to pay for your health care, it really hits home for a lot of people. Yeah, and there, you know, hopefully, hopefully that this will come to a, um, a close and it'll be in our favor. Uh, but we're definitely, we definitely have our eye on United Technologies just all around the country right now. Okay. So. Well, thank you so much, Delane. Thank and you. And we will keep you up to date through our social media pages and on iMail, which is our twice-weekly newsletter that goes out on Tuesday and Thursdays via email to your inbox. So thank you, Delane. All right. Have a great show. Thank you. And you two can join the conversation. So check us out on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. If that's where you're watching us right now, you can make a comment. So comment what you think about any topic topic that we're talking about on this show. Uh, you can also hit the reply button on Twitter and let us know what you think there um, about any of these topics or anything that you would like us to know. 
Well, community service isn't just about our neighbors. It's about our union family. And after Hurricane Florence, we want you to know that the union is here to help. Well, joining us now is Carlos San Miguel with an update. Now, we've been through hurricanes before, Carlos. You know, we've had Hurricane Florence most recently. Where are our members affected? Right now, our members are being affected um, throughout the uh, Carolinas, um, mostly uh, around uh, District 110, which is Havelock, uh, North Carolina. Uh, have a young lady down from the airlines uh, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and they seem to be doing fairly well right now, but we have a lot of rising water right now uh, in North Carolina. Um, we've been in uh, constant communication with the AFL-CIO and uh, we're getting together, moving folks down to uh, uh, Havelock sometime this weekend, if not the early part of uh, next week, delivering uh, some uh, tractor trailers with uh, goods to give out to our members. We'll be housed out of District 110. Now, we've been through hurricanes before. What are some of the things that you hear from the members that they need immediately that they just can't? Well, believe it or not, in the past, uh, most people don't realize that to a person who's affected by the severe floods and um, they're looking for a place to be able to take a quick shower to wash their clothes. And uh, there's a lot that they're trying to do right now uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some of those uh, trailers down there that have uh, showers made up in them for our members and also to be able to wash some clothes, believe it or not. So we're in the, be in the beginning stage with the AFL-CIO uh, to be able to move down uh, uh, several different uh, organizations, uh, labor unions to go down there and help. It's a very large area of not just IAM members, but other unions down there as well. Now, how can we help? How can people at home help if they would like to some way donate um, either items or funds? Well, you know, it's the same, uh, same situation that we had uh, last year. Uh, we have set up where you can uh, go to uh, our website uh, and be able to donate money through there. Um, if you have no other means, you, if your electrical power is down and you're wanting to assist others, you can simply send a check here to IAM uh, AW. Uh, you can put uh, attention uh, disaster relief or you can put attention Carlos San Miguel at 9000 Machinist Place, Upper Marlboro, Maryland. And I see uh, this is our disaster release form here. Mm -hmm. Is this for our members who need help? Uh, this is a, uh, a form that um, you can actually access on the internet to be able to donate money. Gotcha. Okay. So yes, uh, the only thing we're asking is uh, we don't want folks to be donating any clothing. Okay, uh, that turned out to be a major problem in the uh, um, last year's uh, hurricanes. You know, we donated, uh, uh, clothes was donated, not, not particularly uh, any of us, but uh, clothing was donated and unfortunately uh, it had, uh, it was infected with insects and stuff. Oh, okay. And all the uh, clothing that was, uh, in the uh, tractor trailers was affected so it wasn't able to be used so no clothing if all possible unless it is brand new clothing okay okay that's good to know because people don't think about that no and it was everybody was rushing out to help you know and we applaud those that were trying to help so um how else can we help you i know we only think about the disasters when we hear about them but we're hoping that people will donate throughout the year but I know this is when we're thinking about it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things, uh, what I'm grateful to is, you know, we have an excellent communications department and the staff is just wonderful. Um, they're helping uh, create new things. We have a new disaster relief uh, pamphlet that we're right. going to be passing out to everyone. Right. Uh, it shows our own members 
um, that were affected by the hurricanes uh, out of Puerto Rico in a big effort. Um, and on, in the uh, brochure, it gives you a quick uh, information on how to donate your money. Uh, and if uh, you find yourself to, uh, being affected by these disasters, contact information is on the back side of this uh, uh, little brochure. This okay. is great, and we have so many tours that come through on Friday, mm -hmm. so we can hand these out to people here on tours as well, or, or people taking classes down mm -hmm. at the Wimpersinger Center. Um, so and, and I do like to mention, uh, we have a new disaster relief guide, okay? Uh, that is uh, in the disaster relief uh, web, uh, where you can get to the website, you can look up disaster relief. Uh, the forms are located in there that our members need to fill out. And the form is a simple form. You fill it out, you get your representative to uh, verify it. It goes up to your uh, territory. Your general vice president signs it, uh, forwards it up here to headquarters, and we process the claims. Uh, in last year's uh, hurricane season, uh, with the three huge hurricanes that we had, our biggest um, problem that we had, everybody was... Uh, sending in photographs because we were asking for photographs. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it a lot simpler for our members. On the form under the uh, description where I ask you to list the damages to your home, I need to know exactly what structural damage your home received. Unfortunately, we do not have the means to pay for contents. So listing your uh, stereos, your TVs, your appliances, Unfortunately, we can't help with that. Hopefully, your uh, homeowner insurance will take care of that. What I need to know is that your home was flooded, uh, that you had to remove uh, three feet of drywalling, uh, you had to remove your flooring. That's the structural to the home that we're looking for. And when you fill in that out, uh, getting it uh, verified by the, one of the uh, designated representatives in your area is sufficient to get a claim submitted and get you uh, funds to you quickly. Okay, we are so helping, hoping that uh, many of our members will help, and they have in the past, um, because we, you know, that's in our mantra, you know, justice on the job, service to the community. Um, so one of the ways they can do it is by texting IAM help to 55,000, and I just want to give Carlos a chance if there's anything else you'd like to mention about who's eligible. Um, or how much is available, um, I'll give you the opportunity to do that. If uh, Right now, we've been very fortunate uh, that uh, our members really stepped up. We had major uh, corporations uh, that we work with that made big donations. Uh, again, like I stated uh, last year, we have uh, hit the history books with donations. Right now, I have... Uh, almost four hundred thousand dollars available to our members That's great. Uh, if they meet the criteria okay uh, and remind them about some of the criteria okay well uh, the big thing is if um, you, you have to understand you I need to know exactly two things I need to know your IAM membership card number if you don't know that membership card number, then you need to get with your secretary treasurer in your local lodge and get them to give you that card. Because that, if I don't have it, I can't quickly search to make sure that you're a member in good standing. The second thing, to me, is the important thing. I need to know if you own that property or you simply rent. Okay. Because there's a big difference there in the amount of that I can provide. Okay. okay? And I do want to give a big shout out to our local lodge, uh, 2444 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Once again, they have come to our needs of our members. They have started collecting goods. Um, the uh, president, uh, Craig uh, Bodford, is the uh, president for local 2444. And uh, his wife, uh, Angela, uh, actually is the... Uh, office uh, manager and they were going to collect the uh, goods they're going to take them down to Havelock district 110 and um, I'm happy to hear uh, you know with Harley Davidson yeah 
The uh, local Harley Davidson shop has always worked hand in hand with local 2444, and they have uh, donated a lot of stuff too for our members. So I I thank them, and if anybody needs to collect anything or is collecting, wants to know how to get this stuff to our members, they can contact here at headquarters and ask for me. Okay, thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you for Miguel. having me. Thank you, Carla San Miguel with GST Services. He's our GST Services Director. And if you're not in the IAM, GST stands for General Secretary Treasurer. So we are going to ask you to help, if you can, during this disaster, as you always have. All you have to do is text IAM HELP to 55000. That's all one word, IAM HELP. To 55000, and you will reach the IM Disaster Relief Fund. Let us know if you've ever been through a natural disaster or if you've ever given back to the community after a hurricane such as this. You can comment on Facebook, you can hit the reply button on Twitter, you can also use the live chat version on YouTube to let you know, let us know how you're doing as well. I know there's a feature on Facebook that lets you know if you are safe in an area, but let us know how you're doing um, if it has to do with a natural disaster. Well, Mechanics Local 701 is working with Chicago's Prosser Career Academy to help the high school develop a cutting-edge training program in automotive technology. Program Director Dan Donahue joins us now with details. Thank you, Dan, for joining us. Good afternoon, Tonya. Now, how did this partnership first come about? We, dealt with, we, we approached Prosser last year and uh, we were interested in seeing which one, which of their students uh, had potential to be uh, apprentices, apprentice mechanics. And um, we were able to speak to some of those students. We were able to get those students interested. And uh, during the course of that year, the city of Chicago and Chicago public school system decided to invest uh, about a million and a half dollars into the Prosser Auto Program. And since we had already developed a relationship with Prosser, uh, the Chicago Board of Education asked us to step in and work with the school to develop a curriculum and an equipment list and uh, a career path for their students. So we said we'd be glad to help. You mentioned the curriculum. What are some of the things the students will be learning? Uh, we suggested that the students, because they're not they don't get to spend full time on auto because they're high school students and they have to fill out their general education requirements. And so there's a limited amount of time they can spend learning uh, auto. So we, we, we suggested that instead of going into depth on a lot of subjects, uh, that they spend more time on the basics so that these students, if they choose a career in, uh, in a, at a car dealer, they can go right in and be a loop tech. And they have their skills developed for that and honed for that, and they're practiced for that. We are really I think, the, I think the, uh, the Board of Education liked that because Chicago now requires all of their graduating seniors uh, before they graduate, I don't know how they stop them, but that they, they, they outline what their career path is, either the military or college or uh, a career, an apprenticeship. And so. The, the investment and local, local 701's involvement is going to help the Chicago Board of Education achieve those goals for those kids. We are really pushing vocational training. How important is it that we meet these children, the, well, young people, um, at the high school level before they graduate? Well, the, the good thing about uh, our relationship with Prosser is we get to see the best and the brightest, and we get to offer the best and the brightest students of Prosser uh, an apprenticeship bef before they even graduate uh, from high school. So they're ready to go right from high school into an apprenticeship program here in Chicago and to get a full-time job and start earning pension credits and uh, qualify for health insurance while their peers are still um, at uh, jobs that don't offer that. Now, you have a summer pre-apprenticeship program at Local 701. Tell us about that. 
We do. We received a grant last year from the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. And part of that grant was to develop a, a summer program. One problem we have with it is there's career fairs for high schools. And we end up in a beauty contest with people uh, like the community colleges and the for-profit um, mechanic schools that have a lot of money to spend on glitz and glamour. And uh, even though we provide a better education uh, to for mechanic for the for auto mechanic at an incredibly reduced cost compared to our competitors, we can't compare it to the glitz. And so what we decided to do instead of going out to all of the uh, high schools and being part of the beauty contest, we will bring the students here so they can see what they get uh, for their uh, tuition dollar and. Uh, what our facility is, and so that's what we did. And we developed a list of all of the um, high schools in the area that offered auto, which is about 120. And uh, then we figured out who the principal and the uh, chief, uh, uh, the head counselor, the head of the career tech department, and the auto teachers were. And we sent them all an email, and we asked them to nominate their best students to come to our summer program. Thank you. I was just about to ask you who was eligible and how they can apply. Well, they can't apply. They need to be nominated by their school. So, because we want this to be special, we want it to be uh, valued, and so it's we want the best of the best, and uh, so that when they go back to their schools, they tell their teacher and their underclassmen that this is the way to go. This is what you should be doing. Before you go, tell us about the instructors. Who is actually doing the teaching? Well, we, uh, we were very fortunate. There's a community college here called Prairie State, and they have an instructor whose name is Tony Kamujian. And uh, I uh, ran, into, well, ran into Tony by chance, but we began to talk and about how we need to raise the standards for our students because the the job of being an auto mechanic is a lot more sophisticated than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And you need to be more um, uh, adept at science and math. And so we created a STEM program that uh, integrates the science principles and math principles of what's going on in an engine and in a car system uh, to why it breaks and how to fix it. And uh, that was the... Uh, the carrot that we use to get the best of the brightest students. This is not just a, you know, what wrench is this and how to change a tire. This is pretty sophisticated uh, training. Anything else you'd like to mention, Dan? That's okay. Thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Thank you. That's Dan Donahue. He's the program director at the local 701 training fund in the Chicagoland area in our Midwest territory. Well, let us know what you think about vocational training by commenting on this video. We'd like to hear from you watching at home, even if it's during the replay. So you can comment, you can like, and you can share. Well, any day now, the Senate Judiciary Committee could take a final confirmation vote on the latest Supreme Court nominee and eventually lead to a full Senate vote. Communications Representative John Lett takes a look at the history and possible future of the Supreme Court through the eyes of author Ian Milheiser. After analyzing the history of the U.S. Supreme Court, one informed observer says it could easily be called no foe. Ian Milheiser is a legal analyst at the Center for American Progress and author of Injustices, a book about the Supreme Court's history of anti-worker rulings. Milheiser says at one point the court was out to make life worse for ordinary Americans to the benefit of people who are pretty well off. One section of Injustices reviews what Supreme Court scholars call the Lochner era, a troubling time period that started in 1897 and lasted 40 long years. When the Supreme Court struck down minimum wage laws, it struck down child labor laws, it struck down laws limiting the number of hours that workers could be forced to work at a time when workers were sometimes working 18-hour days and 120, 130-hour weeks. 
um, it struck down laws protecting the right to unionize and basically said to workers that you are on your own. The Lochner era takes its name from a 1905 landmark legal case called Lochner versus New York, where the court ruled in favor of a bread bakery sweatshop. Shockingly, the court believed horrendous working conditions at the business were protected under the Constitution. The floors were often just dirt or they were rotted through. There were rats. Um, there was one case where in the bathroom the entire wall was black because it was covered in cockroaches. Um, there was raw sewage dripping from pipes in the ceilings. And by the way, this was the ceiling above the tables where the workers were making the dough that was cooked into the bread. And it was hot because there was this blaring oven that was cooking the bread. So they were working these infernos. With, they had to stoop over because the ceilings were so low. They were working these impossibly long hours. And on top of that, many of them were forced to sleep on the very tables where they were kneading the bread and they had to pay rent for the privilege to sleep on that table. So they would wake up, they would be at their workstation when they woke up, they would then spend 18 hour days making bread in these, you know, pungent infernos. Fortunately, law and order would begin to be restored in 1937 when the court bucked its anti-labor reputation by ruling in favor of a short-changed worker in Washington state who sued for a higher minimum wage. But Milheiser says the Supreme Court's recent tilt to the right could signal a reemergence of a Lochner era like ideology. Things are going to get really bad in the Supreme Court. I mean, I think that a lot of people don't understand how bad things are about to get. Now that was Ian Milheiser, and that was just a preview of a video that John Lett did. His full video is available on our YouTube page if you just search Machinist Union. Milheiser's book is called Injustices. And joining us now to talk about the Lochner era is IAM General Counsel Mark Schneider. Thank you so much for being here, Mark. Well, thank you, Tanya. I always love to come on your show. Thank you. We appreciate it. This is like your third time, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. He's a regular now. <laughs> Well, we just heard about some deplorable conditions um, of these bakers. For people who may just be joining us, tell us a little bit about this landmark case, Lochner versus New York in 1905, was Something it? Something like that in the, f in the first decade of that century. It's one of a series of cases where the five members of the court struck down labor laws. Uh, the, the conditions were horrible. These were bakers who were working, you know, 18 hours a day. It was very hot. Uh, and the, the state of New York passed a law, one of the first labor laws, that said there's, there's a maximum number of hours you can work as a baker. And the bakery owner, a named, guy named Lochner, sued and said that he had a right under the Constitution to contract with bakers, and, this, and the court couldn't interfere with that. Or the, sorry, the state couldn't interfere with that. Uh, although in my copy of the Constitution, there was no such right. Uh, the Supreme Court agreed. And uh, five of them said, yeah, the, the, the New York State can't pass a protective law that protects workers. And this was one of a series of laws. There was um, uh, minimum hour laws. There were child labor laws. The, the conditions that children worked were, were horrible. And the thought that um, children were free to contract with employers and the, and the state couldn't protect them. There were laws uh, struck down that were trying to protect women. Uh, it was a, a terrible era, era in our court system. So we think eight hours or ten hours is a long time for an adult to work, so I can't imagine a child working that long and even longer than that. No, we've, we've come a long way, and we've come a long way largely through unions and through progressive labor legislation. And these justices in this era, I don't know, 1900 to 1937, uh, were not about that, and they struck down uh, many of those, those, most of those laws. Now, why was this so controversial at the time? Was it that tug of war between, like, states' rights and federal rights? It, it became controversial after the Depression, because the Depression hit, remember the Great Depression, and there was a desperate need for regulation to, to bring the economy back up. And this court had already struck down the labor laws, already said another right it found in the Constitution was a right to fire workers if they threatened to organize. Again, I can't find that in the Constitution. Um, That's a funny thing, how you can't find things that they... Uh, yeah, they found. Uh, so 
so there was a desperate need for action. Uh, Roosevelt was elected on a platform of taking action, Franklin Roosevelt, and they began striking down his laws. Uh, and that's why the th era became so infamous. Now, in 1937, things began to change after that. So we had 40 years of this Lochner era, which is basically a generation or two. Yeah, uh, one thing about the Supreme Court justices, they, they appoint them young and they, and they serve till they die. Uh, or many of them do or almost die. So we can be in an era, and I, unfortunately, I think this is very contemporary and relevant because we may be entering another one where uh, you have extreme pro-business judges and they stick around for quite a long time. Ian Milheiser was saying that, you know, he doesn't believe that people know how bad this could get. Um, do you agree with that, that, that this could, as you said, get pretty bad? Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent book. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. Uh, they, they're one of our three fundamental branches of government, and they're the one that's not elected. They're appointed for life, so they have, the, you can't recall them. I mean, they're, they're there. So it can be very bad, and they, they, can, they don't have an army, but they can do what they want. They, they want to strike down a law, they, they find something in the Constitution and say it's no good. So that's what happened, and it could definitely happen again. You know, I really am a big fan of checks and balances, and I, I believe the way our country was set up was supposed to be for checks and balances. Um, do you think if we hadn't had the New Deal with Roosevelt, do you think that, that checks and balances would have gone away? That we would have lost it altogether? I, 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 think, uh, I think the country was in pretty desperate straits then, and I think something like what happened was going to happen. The, the, the thing was going to tilt. In fact, this era ended when one of the five justices changed his mind and uh, realized he'd been making a mistake for 30 years and started voting to pass the New Deal legislation. There's a, in fact, there's a scene in the book there. It's described where the first vote he voted to change his mind, one of the masterminds of the group of five that were doing this actually stormed out of the court. He couldn't take it. Wow. So, uh, for someone standing up for what they believed in. Yeah, for someone, or for a, just a state passing a law to protect workers, that it was not an accident that this, these cases were all labor cases. Uh, it, it was the business interests of this country that uh, had the ear of these five justices, and they were doing whatever the business interests want. And if you let business go unchecked, what you get are the kind of sweatshop conditions you had, Mac, you know, working long hours, children working, uh, no, so, no social security, no pension. All that was at risk mm -hmm. uh, in, until the, the court finally relented in, in the middle of the Roosevelt's term. The things that we take for granted now, like minimum wage, which we're still fighting over. They, they struck down Roosevelt's first minimum wage law. They struck down uh, a railroad retirement. They s struck down that. Uh, yes, the things we take for granted and that businesses will now pay lip service to, businesses bitterly fought, uh, and they had five justices who would do what they want, and I don't doubt that it th could happen again. I'm going to read a quote to you, and I didn't tell Mark I was going to do this, but we're going to put it up on the screen. This is a quote from John Roberts, and it was when he was having his confirmation hearings, and he said, you go to a case like the Lochner case, you can read that opinion today, and it's quite clear that they're not interpreting the law, they're making the law. What do you think of that? Well, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, I, I don't know where in the Constitution Chief Justice Roberts found a right for uh, people protected by a union in a workplace not to contribute their fair share to the costs of collective bargaining, which they, he just voted to do last term. He found that in the Constitution. So the question is, it's easy to attack the Lochner era. That happened a long time ago. And right now, I think large parts of the country think that child labor, for example, should be banned. We'll see what happens in the future with a future set of laws when a future progressive Congress needs to pass them and what Justice Roberts will do then. We're watching very carefully. Yes, um, we are. Especially this week. Can you just give us an update on where we are in this nomination process? Right. It's before uh, the, the committee that has to pass on the nomination. The Senate advises and consents. Uh, I mean, right now, as you know, there's a woman come forward who says she was uh, a, a molested and abused by uh, Kavanaugh when she was in high school. Uh, and there's fussing right now. I haven't seen the news the last few hours about whether she'll testify or not testify. She says she'll testify, but she'd like there to be 
uh, an investigation first, so th 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 she's just not subject to abuse up there by these men on the Judiciary Committee. Um, until this came up, everyone was saying that uh, he will pass. He's uh, and they were aiming for October first. They right? want him to be sitting on the court when the court started, and you know, there's a small chance that the Senate will flip come next January uh, after the November elections, and the Republicans won't be able to rubber stamp whatever President Trump wants on judicial appointments. So they're very eager to get it done before that happens. So yeah, they they want to act quickly. Um, the early this morning I heard that they're going to have a vote you know Monday and they're not going to wait if she doesn't want to come up Monday tough luck for her so we'll see we'll see well people are making their voices heard on uh, both sides of the issue they're calling their senators and representatives and and that's why we call this activate your voice because we want to make our voices heard especially at worker as workers um, if there's anyone that is going to be on the highest court of the land we want to make sure it's not an anti-worker Justice. Right, and the the thing about Justice Kavanaugh, who's a, uh, you know, he's a well-known, well-respected judge, but his principal characteristic is he is actively and aggressively pro-business. Uh, he's actively hostile to labor. So you will have, if he is confirmed, a group of five justices, just like in the Lochner era, who will act in lockstep with business and against the interests of labors. And it's just not hard to imagine an election in two years, two and a half years, where we elect a Democratic president, God willing, and a Democratic Congress, and they begin to pass laws necessary to protect people again. And you have these five guys, and they are all men, rejecting those laws on things they find in the Constitution that no one knew were there before. So this Lochner era, could be recreated, which is why I think it's so terrific that we're having this discussion about the Lochner era now. Yes, if we don't learn from our history, we are bound to repeat it. Indeed, indeed. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day, Mark Schneider. Thank you, I much appreciate it. We appreciate you. Well, let us know what you think about the Lochner era, which you just learned about, and the future of the Supreme Court. Comment now on Facebook. Twitter, where you can hit the reply button, or YouTube with the live chat feature. And let us know if you've read the book Injustices by Ian Milheiser. We showed you a video earlier that was produced by John Lett. We will have that video up in a few days. I misspoke. It's not up there yet. We gave you a preview, though. Um, so keep an eye on our YouTube page. If you just search Machinist Union, you'll see our YouTube channel, and you'll be able to see that video, which is an in-depth look at the Lochner era by author Ian Milheiser, who is also the, um, an editor at thinkprogress.com, which is part of the Center for American Progress. Well, looking back at this week in history, in the old machinist weekly newspaper from September 16, 1965, look at this picture of working women. These women are IAM members at Bendix Radio Division in Towson, Maryland. At the time, they made up actually women made up one-third of the workforce. They assembled car radios for Chrysler, Ford, American Motors, Kaiser Jeep, and other companies at the time. So we would like to remind everyone that there are great resources also for Machinist Union members through a lot of our communications um, outlets that we have. One of them is now our iMail, which comes out twice weekly. So this is our modern version of the um, mach old machinist um, newsletter. For Machinist Union members, you can also go to iamadvantage.org. That's iamadvantage.org. Org. And at this website, it has information about employee assistance, free college, and all of the consumer benefits from Union Plus. It's a one-stop shop for help when you need it. So check out iamadvantage.org. Org. More than 1,000 people have already signed up for free college through our partnership with Eastern Gateway Community College. There's even a new degree focus area of information technology. Um, so there's a lot of great information there. If you haven't checked it out, just go there and check it out. 
We want to give a big shout out to the EAP4 class taking place this week at the Wimpersinger Education and Technology Center in Hollywood, Maryland. And looking at the IM calendar of events, here's what's coming up in terms of classes and meetings. EAP special topics, the FSC Intermediate Steward Training, HAZMAT, FSC Collective Bargaining, and the Advanced Communicators class. So registrations are due if you're interested in taking any of these classes, and you can get more information on the website, wimpasinger.iamaw.org. And as far as our other dates go, next week is the Young Workers Strategy Program in Hollywood, Maryland. Uh, the Midwest Territory Staff Conference takes place in New Orleans, September 24th to the 28th. Uh, October 9th to the 12th is the AFL-CIO Metal Trades Conference in Las Vegas. November 15th to the 17th is the Guide Dogs of America events. Uh, this is really the largest fundraiser for our favorite charity, Guide Dogs of America. That will take place in Las Vegas, Nevada as well. Um, they usually have a clay sport event. They have a motorcycle Hogs for Dogs ride. Um, and there's the Wimpasinger Charity Banquet that takes place as well, and we recognize a lot of our locals and districts um, who raise money for Guide Dogs of America, which gives dogs, guide dogs, free of charge to blind and visually impaired people throughout North America. Well, thank you for joining us for Activate Live. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we hope to bring you a look at the Young Workers Strategy Program and an update on Industrial's Global Union North American Communications Forum. I'm going to attend at least two out of the three days there, and we'll meet a lot of people from around North America, and we'll give you a little update on, on what's being discussed and how we can help each other union-wise. Uh, in Canada, Mexico, the United States. So thank you very much. We'll see you next week.